Welcome to Around San Diego and a very happy Hispanic Heritage Month to you. Glad to have you with me. I'm Jenny Day. I'll get you caught up on our top stories and look ahead in just 30 minutes. We do begin though with the homeless crisis. We spoke with one man who is now living on the street for the very first time in his life, and he says that he's been told that shelters have no space for him. Every morning, San Diegans line up hoping to be assigned a spot in a local shelter. But as this man who's new to the system found out, getting a bed is not as easy as you'd think. CBS 8's Steve Price introduces us to him and has his story. If you live in the city of San Diego and suddenly find yourself homeless, you will be directed here to the city's homelessness response center, but there's a good chance you'll be turned away without a bed, like what happened this morning to a man we'll call Scott. I haven't been down here like this in ever. Scott says this is the first time he's ever faced sleeping on the street. He was living with his mom, but when she passed away, her house went back to the bank. Then COVID hit and he lost his job at a restaurant. He's been living off social security and savings, but now he can't afford a roof over his head. It's disturbing to see this, you know, and uh, I had been watching it on the news myself for years and, and uh, never thinking that I, you know, would be here, you know, personally, but then seeing it up close, it's, it's awful. Scott lined up at the city of San Diego Homelessness Response Center around 430 Wednesday morning, hoping to get space in a shelter, but they told him there were no beds. They turned everyone away. There was no beds for anybody. CBS 8 requested shelter bed records from the San Diego Housing Commission, and we poured over months of data from this year. On a great day, we found 17 beds available for a single adult male, but we also found days with zero beds. Bottom line, the city wants people off the street, but doesn't have even close to the shelter space needed to make that happen. I've talked to so many people on different resources, called them all and spoke with them all and went where they wanted me to go and did what they wanted me to do. And so far, nothing has come of it. CBS 8 reached out to the city and received a statement saying in part, the city has non-law enforcement outreach teams working daily to encourage people experiencing homelessness to accept offers of shelter. As for days when there appear to be no beds available, they added, it's important to note that looking solely at the San Diego Housing Commission's daily coordinated intake shelter numbers does not provide a holistic view of the city's shelter system. I'm just hoping, you know, for the best, praying for the best. But what Scott knows about that shelter system is that tonight there's no place for him. He's reduced all of his belongings into what will fit in a backpack and will try again tomorrow for a spot to call home. If it wasn't for my faith in God, I would be a mess. I'd probably completely be in despair and depressed. In the East Village, Steve Price, CBS 8. Yes, yeah, Steve, thanks. So you know it. We have been following the housing crisis here in San Diego closely. You can find more of our coverage online at CBS8.com or by downloading our free CBS8. App. And right now, city Life leaders in Tula Vista are considering a ban on homeless encampments. It would be similar to the ordinance passed in the city of San Diego that bans tents in public spaces as long as there are shelter beds available. It comes as officials in the South Bay report a rise in people living on the street. We've gone from about an average of 200, and now we're seeing an increase to potentially up to 300. We want to make sure that we get homeless off the streets, but we need to protect our small businesses, families, and neighborhoods. Yeah, I spoke to the mayor just a few days ago. So right now, police in Chula Vista enforce encampments that block that right of way. For example, on a sidewalk, the homeless outreach team then makes each person aware of the resources that are available. You can weigh in on a possible ban during a public workshop happening on October 5th. Meantime, the San Diego County Board of Supervisors has unanimously passed a plan that would give working parents more child care options. The county says child care is a pillar of economic development. So using existing funds from the American Rescue Plan Act, the goal is to increase capacity at new and current daycares by enhancing infrastructure and to invest in staffing and training. Under this plan, a flex system will also be tested that would give paid time time off for county workers in need of emergency childcare. 
Also right now, 18 mayors in our region are calling on Governor Gavin Newsom to declare a state of emergency over the sewage crisis in the South Bay. Officials say Tropical Storm Hillary made the very bad situation at the South Bay International Wastewater Treatment Plant even worse. These are photos before and after Hillary showing what the damage looks like. Right now there is a plan to renovate this treatment plant and expand it, but it's going to cost anywhere from 600 to 900 million dollars. In the letter to Newsom, the mayor say that the damage at the plant is bringing pollution to surrounding areas and will cause beach closures for years to come. The whole region is to, is linked to the their economies are linked to the Baja California economy, right? They are, and so if something impacts them, it's going to impact the other cities as well. Last month, Governor Newsom's office announced the EPA has allocated $350 million to repair and expand the plant. But those who live in the South Bay want to see action now. Well, a San Diego Sheriff's deputy convicted of stealing prescription drugs from a drop box at the Vista substation appeared in court this week for sentencing. Attorneys say that the deputy became addicted to opioids after suffering an injury while on duty. So as CBS 8's David Godfordson reports, the deputy was facing 13 years in prison before reaching a plea deal for probation. He will be granted formal probation in the following terms and conditions. Deputy Sheriff Corey Ritchie pleaded guilty to one count of burglary last month and as a result was sentenced to probation Monday in downtown court. I just want to go over some of the conditions and that is that you not knowingly possess a firearm or ammunition. The 15 year veteran of the San Diego Sheriff's Department is married with children and worked at the downtown jail, according to his defense attorney Earl Pott. Unfortunately, while on duty, he sustained a severe neck injury caused by an inmate and became addicted to opioid painkillers that were prescribed to him for two years. Richie originally was charged with 13 counts of burglary, accused of breaking into a prescription drug drop box on at least a dozen different dates at the Vista Sheriff's substation. Deputy District Attorney Cal Logan said Richie used his access badge to enter the station. Deputy sheriffs have um, access badges. It can give them access to a variety of, uh, of the institutions. A lot of them work assignments at a variety of locations. Logan said the deputy was caught on surveillance cameras stealing the drugs from drop boxes where members of the public can deposit old prescription drugs. Uh, law enforcement does everything they can to take care of their own. And unfortunately, uh, Mr. Ritchie suffered from an opioid addiction and it got the better of him. Ritchie is still listed as being on unpaid leave with the sheriff's department. But now that he has a felony conviction, he likely will be let go soon. Mr. Ritchie did not buy or sell drugs. He entered and completed a residential drug rehabilitation program. He has submitted to weekly urine tests over the past eight months without a single positive test. The judge ordered Richie to continue his outpatient treatment for opioid addiction. He will be on probation for two years up in Riverside County, where he currently lives. At the downtown courthouse, David Goffertson, CBS 8. David, thanks. And a man accused in a deadly wrong way crash on Interstate 15 is pleading not guilty to four felony charges, and he has been released from custody. Officers say 25-year-old Andres James Cox was drunk at the time of the crash. The head-on collision left one woman dead and her 13-year-old daughter seriously injured. Cox is free on a $500,000 bond, but the judge ordered him to wear drug and alcohol monitoring devices, and he, of course, is not allowed to drive. He also gave Cox a stern warning. One dirty test for alcohol or drugs, you will be remanded into the custody of the sheriff on no bail. So I am very serious about that, sir. You have one chance and one chance only. If convicted on all charges, Cox could face up to 14 years in prison. We're just seeing it, you know, not only in our city, but in this county and across the nation where people are not afraid to shoot at the police. 
New numbers show gun threats against San Diego police officers have hit a five year high. CBS 8 Shannon Handy spoke with police chief David Nislight about the alarming trend and what may be contributing to it. Chief Nislight says his officers have been threatened with a gun shot at or shot more times this year than the last two years combined. As for why, he says there are a number of reasons, including laws that aren't tough enough on crime. Body camera footage shows the moment a San Diego police officer was shot at while responding to a separate shooting outside an Encanto home August 28th. It happened as he tried tending to the victim in the driveway. He ran for cover and returned fire. During a SWAT standoff, the suspect was eventually shot and killed by law enforcement. Later, it was revealed he was a convicted felon who once served time for second degree murder. It just seems more and more we're coming across people who are willing to turn and fire at police. According to new numbers released by the department, so far this year, San Diego officers have either been threatened with guns, shot at, or shot eight times. In two cases, officers were hit. In another, a police canine was fatally shot. It's the highest number of incidents recorded in five years, and there's still more than three months left in 2023. Do these numbers surprise you? They really don't. Chief Devin Islide says there are several contributing factors for this alarming trend. For starters, there's been a consistent rise in illegal ghost guns on our streets. But more than that, he blames laws that don't go far enough in dealing with violent criminals. I'm not blaming the district attorney on this. We have an outstanding DA. Uh, I'm talking about state legislation, federal legislation, sentencing guidelines that are being sent down that really are in favor of the person that's committing crime and taking away the authority from law enforcement and taking away the victim's voice of violent crime, which to me is just makes zero sense. The San Diego Police Officers Association, which often disagrees with department practices, agrees with Chief Newslight. I think criminals need to be held accountable for their actions. SDPOA President Jared Wilson talked about a recent case he was involved with as an example. A suspect who was out on bond, a known gang member, was carrying an illegal ghost gun with a 30 round magazine. The offense resulted in a guilty plea and he got an $800 fine. As for what can be done to solve the problem, Wilson says with hundreds of openings, they need more people willing to join the force to help crack down on crime. Meanwhile, Chief Newslight is speaking with state legislators, hoping they'll vote against any bill, which he says favors criminals over police. I'll continue to push for our officers and for our community for better safety measures and for holding people accountable. Shannon Handy, CBS 8 really never felt like I had depression, but now I think I know what it feels like. You're like in a cloud. Yeah, that is the mother of a former San Diego man who was shot and killed while working as a DJ and security guard at a Denver, Colorado strip club. It's been more than a month and the suspect is still at large. Jason Perry was gunned down in the parking lot of the club after a man was kicked out allegedly for being unruly. The motive for the shooting is still unknown, but a suspect has been identified. A $2,000 reward has been offered for information leading to the arrest of 20 eight year old Christopher Roel Hernandez. We know who he is. Yeah, they have videos, they have pictures, they have his driver's license and they say he's in hiding. Well, naturally you're in hiding, but where where is he? Why? Why? I don't know. Are people afraid of him or I don't know. Yeah, there will be a celebration of life for Jason Perry in Scripps Ranch on October 18th, which would have been his 47th birthday. Well, right now there are questions about the fate of 250 of the 300 small animals sent to Arizona by the San Diego Humane Society because of overcrowding at their facilities. So last month, about 300 animals were sent to the Southern Arizona Humane Society, including rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters and rats to Tucson. But we have since learned that only about 50 of those animals are actually at the Arizona shelter. So about 250 animals were reportedly rerouted to a small family family owned rescue group who then adopted them out in a matter of weeks, but that's raising a red flag for other rescue groups. They say it's nearly impossible to responsibly adopt out that many animals in that short amount of time. One is that's unbelievable. Number two is that's unbelievable. Tell us how you did it. Please share your experience. What did you do to get at these animals placed that we're not doing? 
Yeah, so the San Diego Humane Society now wants documentation on where the 250 animals went. CBS 8 reached out to the Humane Society of Southern Arizona, but have yet to hear back. Battalion Chief William McGovern, Battalion Chief Richard Prunty, and Firefighter Faustino Apostle Jr. This week marked 22 years since the devastating terrorist attacks killed nearly 3,000 people on September 11, 2001. Here in San Diego, a ceremony was held on the USS Midway where the main message was to never forget. And all 343 names of the firefighters who were killed on 9-11 were read out loud. That day was emblematic of an ethos and a decision that all firefighters embrace early in their career, which is when the bell rings, we respond. We don't, it doesn't matter how dire the circumstances may look. If it's your duty day, your brothers and sisters are responding, you go with them. And we're so grateful for that. So since 9-11, hundreds of more firefighters have died from post 9-11 illnesses and others continue to suffer from health problems after being exposed to all of those toxins in the air that day. And volunteering to help at Ground Zero on 9-11 as a teenager changed the course of one man's life. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen introduces us to John Paluska. At 18 years old, John Paluska was the youngest rescue and recovery volunteer at Ground Zero on September 11th. He tells me he watched the second tower fall from his Fordham University dorm. We witnessed the second tower collapse um, downtown from, from the Bronx into to Manhattan. Uh, so, um, you know, it was about that point, um, you know, I, we knew that, uh, you know, help was, was needed. And um, I just uh, you know, jumped on an empty subway train and, and went down uh, towards the pile. He immediately went to help and started recovering remains of multiple victims. I really didn't talk about 9-11 for about 17 years. Um, you know, it was what I had done and, you know, the bodies, the victims that I bagged. And, um, you know, m mine is just one of thousands of stories. And these stories, um, you know, are impactful. This experience changed the trajectory of his life. It led him towards enlisting in the military. Yeah, I had no no intention. I mean, I thought I was going to go and, and work and do an undergraduate business, um, you know, degree. And, you know, certainly, um, you know, that much changed my uh, career path. I uh, disenrolled and ended up getting a, a degree in individualized studies, you know, taking courses in, you know, Arabic. The new path led him to earn his Green Beret with military deployments to Iraq, Afghanistan, and other locations across the globe. He is a Purple Heart recipient and is now retired. Today, he is the co-founder of a nonprofit to help educate younger generations of the significance of 9-11. I probably have a little bit more um, inspiration to uh, teach uh, down to the to the youth as well. Um, you know, knowing you know, once you hit 20 years, um, you know that that anniversary was defined as a generation. Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Yeah, didn't talk about it for 17 years. Glad he's able to to share his story now. Wow, Ariana, thank you for that. Well, meantime, a local military dog serving in the U.S. Coast Guard is in the running to earn top dog recognition. Canine Buddha is a finalist in a national competition that recognizes ordinary dogs that do extraordinary things for our country and their handlers. CBS 8's Abby Black shares a possum story about this heroic dog. Meet Buddha. He's been serving in the U.S. Coast Guard for two years, but now he's a finalist in the American Humane Hero Dog Awards. But as he serves our country every day, he's already our hero. His laser sharp focus, determination, and affection 
have helped military canine Buddha earn top dog recognition in the military category for the American Humane Hero Dog Awards. We're just super honored to represent the Coast Guard. The four-year-old German short hair pointer is an explosives detection canine serving with his handler, U.S. Coast Guard Petty Officer First Class Chase Lamer at the Maritime Security Response Team West in San Diego. He does a lot of uh, intense training, whether that's jumping out of helicopters on fast boats. We do a lot of community service in uh, San Diego with local schools. Buddha has protected the Pride Parade, Super Bowl 56 at SoFi Stadium. He's also on the front lines responding to local high school bomb threats and helping to sniff out a total of $195 million worth of contraband during Coast Guard offloads. Uh, military dogs are, are working every day just as hard as uh, every individual in the military and they put their lives on the line as well just like service members and uh, it's important that we give them credit. Buddha is one of only 18 elite trained canines serving in the U.S. Coast Guard. I think he's definitely taught me the importance of being patient and I've definitely learned to become uh, a better person by working with him. American Humane, which is one of the first U.S. animal welfare organizations, started Hero Dog Awards 12 years ago to celebrate standout canines serving as first responders, service or guide dogs, military therapy and shelter dogs. The winner will be announced in November. Each and every dog in the military category is a hero without a doubt, as well as other dogs in the competition. While Buddha's lovable floppy ears stand out, so does his fearless focus and dedication to protecting the U.S. To have a sense of pride and satisfaction knowing that uh, we went out and did everything we could to make sure people were safe. At Broadway Pier, Abby Black, CBS 8. They're so smart and such an asset. So yes, Abby, thank you for that. We're rooting for you, Buddha. Well, as gas prices rise in San Diego County, thieves are caught on camera stealing gas from cars in the middle of the night. And experts say with the high costs, they are not surprised to see something like this. CBS 8 Steve Price spoke to a victim and has more on how you can protect your own tank. It's costing a lot more to put gas in your tank these days and caught on camera, thieves taking it out, stealing your gas in the middle of the night. A man with a gas can and a long tube walking through yards in Claremont. The person who captured this video only checked her footage after getting a concerning call from a neighbor. Hey, you know, we found my gas cap on the ground. The woman who asked not to be identified then checked her vehicles and discovered one had noticeably less gas. It just makes you feel icky, you know, like this, like I'm not, am I really safe here, you know, and is my stuff going to get stolen? Do I have to worry about this? And our ring thing goes off and it's like. <gasps> Here's video from another CBS 8 viewer who had a camera catch a gas thief on his property too. He lives in the Claremont Bay Ho area. The Auto Club of Southern California says they're not surprised to hear about these incidents. The average price for a gallon of gas in San Diego right now is $5.55 a gallon. That is up 16 cents from a week ago. It's up 36 cents from a month ago. Doug Shoup says this is usually a time when prices drop because the summer travel season is over, but refinery issues are causing a spike instead. His advice to car owners? try to park it wherever there's lots of light and lots of passersby. Eyes on the vehicle hopefully will deter thieves from picking your vehicle to steal that gasoline. If you can park in a garage, even better. But for many, street parking is the only option. Our victim says she did file a police report, but so far hasn't had any follow-up from an officer. She's hoping by sharing her video and story, others will at least be aware of the problem and take precautions. As neighbors, we can try to prevent it in our own areas is probably the best we can do. Are they going to catch them? Probably not. I don't. I'm not holding on to any hope about that. But she is hoping that maybe someone will recognize the man and that will convince him to stop. In Claremont, Steve Price, CBS 8. Yikes, Steve, thank you. Stay safe out there. So sheriff's investigators also need your help identifying a man they say burglarized a home in the South Bay. According to investigators, the thief walked into a home on Carvalos Drive in Benita just before noon back on August 22nd. Well, he grabbed a pair of Hermes blankets valued at $5,000 each and then allegedly left. He is described as heavy set and 25 to 35 years old. He may be driving 
driving a light colored 2011 to 2014 model Chrysler 200 convertible. Anyone with information should call Crime Stoppers. It's 888-580-8477. Well, an alert now for pet owners. A judge ordered a woman to shut down her dog training and boarding because former clients and employees have come forward with stories of abuse. It's a business her attorney says that she makes 10 to $20,000 a month doing. CBS 8's Anna Laurel spoke with victims, former employees, and she also sat down with the woman in question. Perfect Pup Sawana is at a house just beyond this gate. Some people know her as Lauren, the dog trainer. She's changed her business names half a dozen times since 2020. But today, a judge ordered her and whatever her business name is to shut down. They are accusing me of mistreating animals, which is something you will never ever see proof of because it doesn't happen. <laughs> Lauren Russell met me in a park in Vista away from her home where she's been running her boarding and training business. Having my house on video is not going to make anything better. This video was taken by former employees. They say it shows too many dogs crammed in kennels, sitting in the garage, covered in feces. On the day that I left, there were 33 dogs on the property. She had up to three dogs in one kennel at a time. Lexi Suwecki tells us she worked for Lauren this summer. It was 85, 90 degrees in the impact kennels, which had very little air. I was very concerned for the dog. Lexi worked and lived with Lauren at that house. There was a teeny tiny little Frenchie. She pulled backwards off of a fountain onto the cement, fell on his neck, fell on his head. I'm a dog whisperer and it, it hurt me very deeply to see the dogs in distress. Former clients have posted to social media and sent me pictures of their dogs after they left them with Lauren. The owner of this puppy says Lauren lied to her about what happened. Others sent me pictures of raw noses, matted skin, and there are stories from former employees of outright violence. Well, I tried to tell Lauren to calm down. You can't kick dogs in the head like that. They'll die. That'll never be proven to be true because it never happened. We have an extreme case of somebody who's who's holding herself out to be uh, this this expert dog trainer who actually has no qualifications whatsoever. Brian Peace is the attorney representing several people who say Lauren is fraudulently operating her business with no qualifications or license to do so. She locks dogs in her garage and she starves them and beats them and. Um, just the, the stories are horrific. This morning, a judge shut down her business until another hearing next month, and she must return all dogs in her possession to their owners. I never, ever would harm a dog. And I know if I heard all these things about somebody else, it would be hard for me to believe them. But there's zero proof. In Vista, this is Anna Laurel for CBS 8. Yeah, hard to see that, Anna, thanks. Well, San Diego is among cities across the country suing Kia and Hyundai for not equipping their vehicles with proper anti-theft technology. Just last year, more than 550 Kias and Hyundais were stolen in San Diego, keeping the city's police department very busy. So the city alleges that the company's vehicles are not equipped with engine immobilizers, which means they don't require a key or key fob to start the engine. The security flaw is found in models from 2011 to 2022. Kia and Hyundai have since developed free theft deterrent software for vehicles that lack immobilizers. Well, controversy is brewing in the Cajon Valley Union School District. The superintendent told staff to take down posters promoting an LGBTQ plus organization. That's due to a policy that prohibits teachers from posting material from an outside group that positions the district on, quote, any side of a controversial issue. Some teachers say this move makes students feel unsupported and unsafe. I'm very worried of the effect that this movement of banning such posters may have on the, our populations of students. Many children, especially in middle school, struggle with feeling accepted and seen. By taking away these posters, it's not only isolating those students, but sending a message that they're no longer supported. I want to share with you the superintendent says the district has resources to support its LGBTQ students. And educators are often unsung heroes, but this week Walmart hit some high notes to recognize one San Diego Unified School nurse. CBS 8's Abby Black was there. She was surprised by students, staff, and family. 
Shh, we're in the auditorium before the big surprise. Each year, Walmart recognizes a standout educator for back to school, but this year, they're honoring someone who has the best medicine for a healthy school year. Laura's elementary students and the registered school nurse thought this was an assembly to kick off the school year to learn about healthy habits. But try to stay in class so you can be learning with the teacher. But it was just a ruse to surprise school nurse Kathy Monroe at the Sarah Mesa Spanish Immersion School. <laughs> in the sea of children, so was the Murphy Canyon Walmart. We are here today because we believe that you are a hero and we want to celebrate that. The store donated $250 worth of health and wellness items to help Monroe stock her supplies. Oh my God, this is amazing. And wet ones to clean up wounds. Walmart's kindness is helping to get to the heart of the matter for so many kids. Some kids don't even have a toothbrush that they can brush every day with. But there's one more goodie just for Miss Kathy. There's also a $250 gift card. Oh so, um... Behind the curtain was another surprise. <laughs> Her colleagues, bosses, and oldest son Robert were there to cheer her on. She is like the definition of a saint. For 10 years, Monroe has been the backbone of this school. The principal says, especially during the pandemic. She's been integral into running the school because we wouldn't have been able, I wouldn't have been able to do it without her. Monroe was an ICU nurse at Rady Children's for 23 years. Say, ah. But she moved to school nursing a decade ago. I love, love my job. No matter how full her plate is covering three schools, Monroe says it's the kids and school staff who fill her heart. It's 90% being a mom, which is my heart and soul, and the other 10% is being a nurse, which I love taking care of them. As Nurse Monroe pulls out more items to stock the medicine cabinet. Oh my God, this is so generous of Walmart. This is amazing. We see sometimes the best remedy is a dose of gratitude. I am completely overwhelmed right now, and I just wanted you to know how much I love, love being there for all of you guys. It's your, my heart and my soul being a school nurse, so thank you so much. What In Sarah Mesa, Abby Black, CBS 8. Whew, I'm such a softy myself, so she's got me teary over here. Just sounds so well-deserved, so love that for her. Congrats. Hey, and what you're looking at here this week, Rady Children's Hospital was also gifted $100,000 to support its pediatric oncology department. It was provided by Hyundai Hope of Wheels, Hope on Wheels, excuse me, a nonprofit dedicated to helping fight children's cancer, of course, a worthy cause. During the event, children got to dip their hands in paint and play them on a Hyundai vehicle, symbolizing the fight against cancer and the hope for a cure. We talked to a former patient of Rady Children's who told us he really appreciates the support. It's very inspiring. Um, these corporations don't, don't owe anyone anything. For them to go out of their way to fund cancer research, to um, help improve the lives of pediatric patients, oncology patients like myself, um, it really means a lot. It's very inspiring. Hyundai Hope on Wheels has awarded $225 million in pediatric cancer research grants to children's hospitals nationwide. Wow. So we are getting a closer look at new renderings of three possible designs for the Ocean Beach Pier. There's a lot of interest here. So the first design is called the Braid. It could have retail, lowered fishing areas and additional bathrooms. Then the second design is the Remora. It has a fishing area and renovated bathrooms. The last design is called the Squint Test. It also offers renovated bathrooms, a resting area and an additional fishing deck and a renovated cafe. So while some are interested about getting a new pier, others believe the designs are far from what OB is all about. They were cool looking, but it would, I would prefer to stay the way it is, if possible. You know, they were neat, but they're real futuristic looking. Yeah, keep OB weird, right? So the city of San Diego is still asking the public for input. You can take a survey that can be found on CBS8.com. Well, we have been seeing the incredible images of the blue waves around San Diego, and now we know a bit more about the teeny tiny marine algae that caused them. In this Earth 8 report, CBS 8's Netta Aranpour takes a deep dive into the latest research. 
If you've searched San Diego's beaches or anything you see San Diego, then you may have come across the work of Eric Jepson, the campus photographer. He's often drawn to the coastline, capturing its beauty with his lens. And of all the photos he's taken in his lifetime, bioluminescence are among his favorite. When there's like a really powerful blue, yeah, you can just like go to the shore and just like kick the water and uh, it, it lights up blue. It's, it's really cool to see. Especially proud of this image, a wave lighting up as a surfer glides through phytoplankton. My favorite photo actually from, from here uh, at Scripps is during the bioluminescence, uh, just watching the, the surfers. It's like, gotta be very difficult to catch a wave at night. But Eric says it's not as difficult to catch the bioluminescence as it used to be. Before, like I, like a decade ago, you'd see the bioluminescence like once every like three years or like two years, but now you see it like three or four times a year. So the, the frequency of it is definitely increased. The reason behind the more frequent findings is something researchers at Scripps Institution of Oceanography are looking into. We're still trying to understand how these uh, events are changing as our oceans change. Drew Lucas is a researcher at Scripps and with the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And in his team's research, they discovered some fascinating behavior by the glow-causing phytoplankton. The specific plankton is called L. polyedra, and it's smaller than a human hair, but faster than a mako shark, going 10 body lengths per second and doing so for 18 or more hours. The analogy I might use is sort of the Michael Phelps of the phytoplankton world. Even faster, it's a, even faster than Michael Phelps, because even Michael Phelps can't keep up with a, with a mako shark. They're fast and they swim up and down from the surface of the ocean to the sea floor. From the surface down to deeper than 100 feet over the course of an afternoon. Using this tool called the wire walker, Drew and his team can follow the El Polyedra. They discovered during the day they photosynthesize by being close to the ocean surface, gaining energy from the sun. That's when you may see that rusty reddish color, a sign of a big bloom. And after sunset, many of them take deep dives in search of nutrients, but not all go down at once, which is why you see the blue glow, appearing when the El Polyedra get agitated. All of this new research is based off the 2020 bloom, one of the strongest ever recorded at Scripps. Prime conditions then included warmer temperatures and calm conditions. Once they get cooking, um, they can dominate. So dominant, they become the only plankton players. The bloom of 2020 lasted more than two months, but when they died off, so can fish and other marine life. As the algae decomposes, it takes away oxygen from the water, essentially suffocating life below it. It really can change our coastal ecosystem. And so our ability to measure that and to monitor that really ha it really projects onto our ability to protect, um, you know, what is an incredibly valuable resource for us here in San Diego. That's why Drew is constantly trying to create new measuring tools, spending months at sea to learn more about the ocean. And we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the bottom of the ocean. And that is really evocative of the fact that the ocean is still, you know, it's vast, it's very deep, it's a very difficult environment um, to get measurements from. And so, yeah, we're still really in the exploration phase, which is very exciting. Exploration is something Eric also appreciates, which is why you'll likely see him on campus or at the beach, snapping photo after photo using his keen eye to show that science is beautiful. For Earth 8, I'm Netta Iranpour. So the best time to see bioluminescence is a couple of hours after sunset, right around 9 or 10 p.m. There have been quite a few sightings over the past few days across Southern California. So tonight might be your lucky night to catch that blue glow again. But we should point out that researchers just don't know exactly how long it will last. I've only seen it one time with my own eyes, but man, it really was just just magical. It's wild. So hope you get to see it too. Well, a San Diego dog groomer is taking the profession to new heights with his luxury business. Gabriel Fatosa has discovered his love for grooming pups in his home country of Brazil when he was just 12 years old. Now dog owners from around the county are shelling out 500 to 1200 bucks to transform their dogs into loving living sculptures. They come either for a celebration, sometimes they just want their dog to look cool, we had dogs that were therapy animals for kids with disabilities. We had a person that had a heart design because she was celebrating beating uh, breast cancer. So they all have their reasons, but ultimately, I think this type of work just brings a lot of joy to everyone around. 
You'll be glad to hear this too. He says all of the products used on the dogs are non-toxic. So far, he says he's done hundreds of transformations with no cases of allergies. Too funny. Well, before we go, take a look at this. More than 50 dogs showed off their surfing skills at Del Mar Dog Beach for the 18th annual Surf Dog Surfathon, benefiting the Helen Woodward Animal Center. Some dogs took off on their own, while others rode with their owners. The best in surf winners were Sugar, who got first place, Delilah in second, and Guinness there in third place. That's impressive. Only in San Diego, right? Well, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for staying informed. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. We'll be back next week with more. Until then, take care.